So you've probably heard me share this before, and you know this, many of you know this about me, but I grew up going to a Christian school, elementary years, middle school, high school, and I, I enjoyed it, but the school that I went to just had a ton of rules. There's lots of rules, you know, and, and, and the big ones, of course, were no, no drinking, no smoking, no drugs, no, no sex before marriage. Those were the big ones. Those were the big ones. But, of course, there were, there were a lot of other rules, too. You know, we weren't allowed to have tattoos. If we, you know, were to get a tattoo, you know, we'd have to hide it or, you know, we'd get kicked out of the school. Um, long hair for guys. We couldn't have long hair. So they would actually check our hair, and if our hair, if they could pull our hair past our ears or touch the collar in the back, we would get a, de a detention. Uh, no movie theaters. We were not allowed to go to movie theaters. And so it was a really big deal when E.T. came out. And my mom decided to sneak my brother and I into the theater to see E.T. That caused a little bit of, uh, a little bit of trouble and uh, tension in, in our household at the time. No rock and roll music. So maybe, maybe you've heard me share this story before, but one time we were in the gymnasium at the school and we were setting something up for some banquet or something and we were playing Michael W. Smith on a boom box. You remember boom boxes with the cassette tapes? We were playing Michael W. Smith and the principal came running into the gym yelling, turn that devil music off! It was Michael W. Smith. So no, no drums, no electric guitars. Uh, and women weren't allowed to wear pants to church. So many of you would be kicked out. You'd be in, you'd be in big trouble. So just, there was just a big focus on rules, following the rules. It was all about behavior modification. Do all the right things. Toe the line. Stop sinning. Stop sinning. Now, a couple of a couple days ago, a few days ago, I saw this video of these little kids, I don't know, like three or four years of age, and they're sitting there at the table, and the dad comes in with this plate of cookies, you know, freshly baked chocolate chip cookies, and sits it in front of them and says, okay, kids, we're not going to eat these right now. Uh, we'll eat them later, but we're not going to eat them right now. And, and, and I have to go. I'll be back in a little bit, but don't eat the cookies. And the dad left, and the kids kind of looked at each other, and they're smiling, and what do you think they did? They ate the cookies. You know, that, that's, what, that's what we do as human beings, right? That's what we do. Don't do that. Stop doing this. Don't sin. What do we do? We sin. And so I just, I saw a lot of my friends rebel and walk away from the church when I was growing up. And honestly, I, I think it's still happening today. I really do. I think it's still happening today. A lot of times, there's this perception that, that Christians, that church people, that we are the behavior police, right? And we're, we're here to point out the sin in others. Stop doing this. Stop doing that. There's this, this big focus on rules and the law and commandments and the do's and the don'ts that are supposed to keep people from sinning, and in reality, it never does, right? And in fact, for many Christians, we, we don't even keep some of the rules ourselves. The world notices. That's why we're called hypocrites a lot of times. It seems that, it seems that God is just this cosmic killjoy, right? And he's trying to keep people from having fun, enjoying life. And so when it comes to the story of Christmas, you know, that, that Jesus came to save us from our sins, that's not good news for a lot of people. He, he came to save us from our sins. He came, us so that we can stop, he, he came to save us so that we can stop doing bad things that are actually good things, if you know what I mean. That, that's, what, that's what he came to do. That's not good news for a lot of people. This, this focus on, you know, behavior and rule-keeping ends up keeping people away from the church, ends up keeping people away from a, re a relationship with their Creator, because that's what the Creator longs. 
for is a relationship with people. Our passage for today, in fact, our, our passage for this entire series, which uh, Brian and Katie read earlier, is, you know, from Luke chapter 2. It's the famous, you know, Christmas story passage, and I, I'll read it again. There were shepherds living out in the fields nearby, keeping watch over their flocks at night. An angel of the Lord appeared to them, and the glory of the Lord shone around them, and they were terrified. But the angel said to them, do not be afraid. I bring you good news that will cause great joy for all the people. Today in the town of David, a Savior has been born to you. He is the Messiah, the Lord. A Savior has been born to you. Jesus is a Savior. He indeed came to save humanity, to rescue humanity. And so today we're going to talk about what are we saved from? What are we saved from? And next week, we're going to talk about what are we saved for? What are we saved for? You see, we have incredibly good news to share with others. It's, it's, it's incredible news. We have a better story to tell. So how can we, how can we begin to reshape the narrative that the world is hearing? Well, there are, there are some things that I think that we really need to understand as followers of Jesus. We really need to understand these things, and then we need to be able to clearly communicate these things with others. And so that's what we're going to talk about today. The first one, what we clearly need to understand and then be able to communicate is that sin is a, a breach in relationship. It's a breach in relationship. You see, with religion— with religion, there's always this gravitational pull towards behavior modification and rule-keeping. But we know, we talk about it all the time, especially if, you know, if you've grown up in the church, you know this. We, we, we believe it, we talk about it, we say it, that Christianity is not like that. Christianity is unique, right? That's what makes Christianity unique. It's not a, it's not a religion. It's not about following rules. It's about a relationship. It's a relationship. We, we talk about it all the time, but, but do we really truly understand that? I think what makes it difficult for people to grasp and why we still gravitate towards behavior modification and rule keeping is that behavior is, is easier to see, right? And it's, it's often, you know, perhaps easier to control. You know, we can see someone's behavior. We can see what's on the outside. We can see if they're following the rules or not, but we can't see what's in the heart. We can't see that. I also think it's difficult for people to grasp, it's difficult for, for us to grasp even, that God wants a relationship with us. The creator of the universe wants a relationship with us. Wants a relationship with you and me. We hear it all the time. We talk about it, but do we really, do we really understand that? I think, I think it's really hard to grasp. But that's the main story that the Bible tells. From beginning to end, that is the main story, that God wants to dwell with people, with humanity. That's his goal. That was the purpose of creation. God created this, this space on earth to dwell with humanity where people could experience his presence. There was relationship with Adam and Eve before the command to not eat from the tree, right? The, 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 the rule was for the sake of relationship. And then later on with the people of Israel, God established a covenant relationship with them, and, and then he gave them the law for the sake of relationship. He gave them the loss so that they could relate to him and then they could represent him to the people around them. And so when humanity sinned, it was a breach in relationship with the one who created them. When they sinned, it, they, were, they were saying, forget you, God. We don't need you, God. We don't, we don't trust you, God. We want to be left alone, God. And so humanity severed their relationship with their creator. But once again, the story that we read in the Bible is that God couldn't stand that it be that way. 
And so he continued. He continued to pursue the relationship. And he promised to restore the relationship. But the story of humanity, and we talked about this last week when we talked about the wrath of God, but the story of humanity is that we're just stuck. We're stuck in this, this way of sin. We continually choose our way over our Creator's way, and we continually choose the way of death and destruction instead of the way of life. You see, the, the problem isn't a behavior problem. We need a change of devotion. We need a change of devotion. Through the prophet Ezekiel, we, uh, God said these words, I will give you a new heart. This was read earlier as well. I will give you a new heart. I will put a new spirit in, in you. I will remove from you your heart of stone, and I'll give you a heart of flesh. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to change your heart. I'm going to change your devotion, and that's what Jesus came to do. The, the shepherds, you know, they went to, to find Jesus in the manger, and that's the incredible story that we, we've been reading each week, this incredible story of Christmas. They, they went to find Jesus in the manger, but the bigger story was that Jesus found them first. Jesus found them first. Jesus came to us first. He is Emmanuel. He's God with us. And so the good news, the good news is that while we were on this trajectory, this path that leads away from our Creator towards death and destruction, once again what we talked about last week, while we were on that trajectory and on that path, He was pursuing us. And religion always reverses that. Religion always reverses that. Watch your behavior. Follow the rules. Do all the right things, and maybe you'll be accepted by God. Maybe, maybe you'll, you'll wake, make your way to God someday. That's, that's the message of religion. But, but the good news of Christianity, the, the good news about Jesus, is that God made his way to us. Not to change our behavior, but to change our devotion. To repair and to restore our relationship with Him. Like He always wanted. So we really need to understand that. And we need to be able to clearly communicate that sin is a breach in relationship. Also, we need to understand and communicate that, that sin is harmful to people. And I think we would say, well, duh. I mean, that's not rocket science, right? Of course. But I don't think this is what we communicate sometimes. For those of us who are parents, you know, we've, we've had kids. Think about this for a second. As parents, we didn't come up with a, a set of rules and then say, you know what? Let's have kids so that we can have someone to follow our rules. That, I mean, that's absurd, right? You know, we're, we're going to have these rules in place, but we're, we're going to have kids so that they can follow the rules so that we can have someone to do what we want and obey our rules. And, and as absurd as that sounds, I think, I think people think that that's what God did. You know, that he made, he, he made a, a bunch of rules and commands. He has these rules and commands in place, and then he created people so that we could do what he wants, so that he could have someone to obey his rules, like the, like the rules and the law and the commands are in place for his sake. But that's, that's a pagan understanding of God. It's a completely pagan understanding of God. One day... On the Sabbath, uh, and this is found in Mark chapter 2, Jesus and his disciples were walking through the grain fields on, Sab on the Sabbath day. And they're, they're hungry, and so they picked the grain, they ate the grain, and that just really upset the Pharisees. And, and so the Pharisees came to Jesus and said, Why are you doing what is unlawful to do on the Sabbath day? Why are you breaking the rules? And Jesus replied, The Sabbath was made for man, not man for the Sabbath. In other words, 
the, the rules, the law, is in place for the sake of people, and not for God's benefit. On another Sabbath day, which we can read about in the very next chapter of Mark, Jesus was in the synagogue, and there was a man with a shriveled hand there. And, and once again, the Pharisees were there, and they were watching Jesus closely to see what he'd do. So Jesus had this man stand up right in front of everybody, and then Jesus asked them, which is lawful on the Sabbath, to do good or to do evil, to save life or to kill? And then he healed the man right there in front of everyone. And that just really ticked these rule followers off. See, we need to understand and we need to clearly communicate that God's law, God's commands, are established for the good of humanity. God wants what's best for people. God wants people to experience life in all its fullness, the kind of life that he created us for, for he created people to live. And when we sin, it breaks his heart. Not because we're breaking his rules, but because we're breaking people. Sin hurts people, including ourselves. So, yeah, you, should, you shouldn't lie. Not because it's a rule, not because it's a command, but because it breaks down relational trust and it hurts relationships. Yeah, you, you, you shouldn't get drunk. You should control your drinking. Not because it's just, you know, some rule, but that, so that, that you don't have a substance that controls you and then destroys you and destroys the, the relationships in your life. Yeah, you shouldn't have sex outside of marriage. Not because it's bad and it's because it's a rule, but because God created sex as a special marital bond, and it's meant to be experienced inside this lifelong marital relationship. And so engaging in it is selfish. It's going to bring harm to yourself and, and the other person. Yeah, you shouldn't overeat because it's going to lead to diabetes and cancer and other diseases and probably end up cutting your precious life short. When I think about animal sacrifice in the Old Testament, you know, I think, you know, it, what, what a vivid picture. What a, what a vivid reminder for the people of Israel of the cost of sin. Sin kills things. Sin makes a bloody mess of things. Sin makes a huge mess of our lives and our relationships because sin is harmful to people. We really need to understand that and communicate that well. And then finally, sin is a failure to love. The Pharisees, once again, were very religious people. They were the, the very religious people of, the, of that day. They were the church people of that day. And they were always trying to trick Jesus and tra trap Jesus and to catch him and, you know, and to catch him doing something that they didn't think he should be doing or to, you know, catch him and, you know, saying something that he shouldn't be saying, they didn't think he should be saying. They were the behavior police of that day. And one day they sent an expert in the law, an expert rule keeper, they sent him to Jesus to trick Jesus, to trap Jesus. And, and many of you probably remember what he asked Jesus. We find it in Matthew chapter 22. Teacher, which is the greatest commandment in the law? What's the most important rule to God? What does God care about the most? That's what he's asking. And Jesus replied, Love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul all your mind, this is the first and the greatest commandment. And I think if he would have stopped right there, I think that the expert in the law probably would have said, good answer. You know, there, there are a lot of really important commandments in the law. In fact, they're all important, but you're right. You're right. That's, that's a good one, Jesus. That, that probably is the best one. That's probably the right answer, and we can't refute that. But Jesus didn't stop there. He continued, and the second, 
is just like it. Love your neighbor as yourself. All the law and the prophets hang on these two commands. All of it hangs on the two commands. In other words, these two commands are one and the same. These two commands are two sides of the same coin. You can't do one without the other. You want to know what God really cares about? It's love. He wants a relationship of love with you, and the way you show your love for him is by loving people, the people that he cares about. And that's everyone, because everyone is created in his image. and He desires a relationship with everyone. So, if, if breaking the law, if, if failing to obey God's commands is sin, and the law can be summed up in this one command, to love, then sin's a failure to love. And the Apostle Paul, you know, said it this way in his letter to the Romans, let no debt remain outstanding except the continuing debt to love one another, for whoever loves others has fulfilled the law. The commandments, you shall not commit adultery, you shall not murder, you shall not steal, you shall not covet. What other, whatever other command there may be are summed up in this one command. Love your neighbor as yourself. Love does no harm to neighbor. Therefore, love is the fulfillment of the law. And this is, this is uh, so much easier said than done, right? Because the, the word that's, that's most often used in the Old Testament to de describe this, this type of love is agape love. And, and many of you have probably heard that before. You know agape. You've heard of agape. The, the New Testament authors had a really hard time describing this type of love because it was, it was so different. So they, they started using God himself and the love that God demonstrates as the definition of of this kind of love, as agape love. First John chapter 4, it says, Dear friends, let us love one another, for love comes from God. Everyone who loves has been born of God and knows God. Whoever does not love does not know God, because God is love. God is agape. And this is how God showed his love among us. He sent his one and only son into the world so, so that we might live through him. So, so agape, agape love, comes only from God. It's only from God. It's, it's, it's who God is. And agape love is, is sacrificial love. It's, it's putting self aside for the benefit of another. Agape kind of love is, is a love that gives its own life away so that, so that others can experience life. And agape love is, a, is demonstrated. It's a demonstrated kind. It's not, it's not a feeling it's demonstrated through action. We have an incredible story. An incredible story to, to tell. It's good news. And the good news is that we can be saved. We can be saved. But not so that we can have better behavior or follow the rules. We can be saved so that we can be kept from sin. We can be saved from our sin. And sin is a breach in relationship with our Creator. We can be saved from the sin that keeps us running away from the one who created us and wants to dwell with us. So what can we do? Number one, let's make sure, let's make sure we prioritize relationship over rules. Prioritize relationship over rules. Draw near to people as God drew near to us through his son. And if there are behaviors that need to change, rules that need to be followed, then we trust, we trust that the Holy Spirit will do his work through our faithful presence in the lives of others. The good news is that we can be saved not from doing bad things that tick God off, but we can be saved from the sin that's destroying us and the people in our lives. 
We can be saved from the sin that's making a bloody mess of things. And so what, what can we do? Number two, confess our sins, not necessarily to God, but to others. Yes, we need to confess our sins to God. That's a given. But we need to go well and beyond that. Confess our sins to others more often. Confessing to others helps us and the others in our lives recognize, it helps us recognize that our sin does damage to people does damage to us and the people in our lives. And so we need to confess our sins to one another more often. The good news is that we can be saved, not by taking away the things that keep us from enjoying life, but we can be saved from the sin that is keeping us from living the kind of lives that we were created to live. And we're going to talk more about this next week. So, finally, let's, let's more faithfully demonstrate love through action. The kind of love that was demonstrated to us while we were still sinners. And I think these things, these things will help us tell a better story. Will help us share uh, the kind of story that is actually the story that the Bible tells. A, a story of a story of, of good, good, good news. The love candle is sometimes called the Bethlehem candle. And it's, a, it's a reminder that the God of the universe, the God who created the world and everything in it, the Creator made His way to us made his way to Bethlehem, made his, his way to a manger, and then made his way all the way to a cross. And he didn't just tell us he loves us. He showed it. He showed us that he loves us. He didn't shout it from a distance. He demonstrated it through sacrifice. You know, our sin, I think, I think we would all admit this, our sin makes a bloody mess of things. It does. Our sin made a bloody mess of our Savior. And He, he took all of that, that pain that we inflict upon ourselves and upon others, upon Himself when He hung on the cross. He defeated it. He defeated it. And that's what we want to remember this morning as we celebrate his death. So let's take the body of Christ. This is the body of Christ that is broken for you, broken for us. Amen. And this represents the blood blood that was shed for our sin.